So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, G.HN, kind of one of those rebel technologies like Mocha, not quite as cool as GFast, but similar to Mocha, got some similar advantages and disadvantages. So I'm actually not here uh, technically on behalf of TELUS, I'm here on behalf of the Gigawire Alliance. So Gigawire is really the, uh, the marketing term for G.HN for access scenarios. So I'm going to give a bit of an update on what TELUS is doing and some stuff on what another North American telco is doing as well. And talk about a, a bit of the uh, standards progression for G.HN at the ITUT. So first, a bit of an overview of, about this technology for those who aren't familiar with uh, the capabilities of G.HN. So this is kind of the physical architecture. So you see here you have a, a multi-port DPU, uh, some number of uh, single-port DPUs, uh, fiber-fed off of an OLT, XGS pawn, GPON, whatever, and then Vector Boost Compute Engine. So the Vector Boost Compute Engine, well, in G.HN, we don't have uh, vectoring like what you have with GFAST. So we have to be kind of clever with crosstalk mitigation that we actually run in the cloud. So it's a really cool real-world example of network function virtualization. Here's an MDU topology really highlighting how this has been widely deployed today by Korea Telecom. So you have basically, similar to what you do with the GFAST DPU, you'd have a GAM, a G.HN access multiplexer, or DPU, whatever you want to call it, uh, connecting to existing in-building wiring that can be twisted pair, coax, a combination of. Fiber fed again, and then we're basically leveraging the in-building wiring, and then we have a G.HN CPE inside each suite. So if you're familiar with the ITUT standard at all, we have quite a bit of flexibility, just like GFAST, uh, at changing upstream and downstream ratios, and some, a clever dynamic spectrum management that I'll talk about in a bit more detail. So this, this is showing a, a single family home topology. It's kind of similar to what TELUS Communications, uh, what we're doing in Western Canada. So we have multiple homes. Uh, for whatever reason, we decided not to do these homes with fiber all the way. We find in some scenarios, in some of these subdivisions, well, we're typically about 1,500 uh, Canadian per home passed. Sometimes I can go up to a couple thousand. Just depends how the subdivision was laid out. But we find in a lot of scenarios, it's just not economically viable to do fiber everywhere. So in this scenario, we would do something like fiber to a pedestal, stack some number of our single port fiber extenders in that pedestal. And then, yeah, simply leverage the existing uh, copper that's in the ground, running the bonding, what we call G.H and SISO, or, or single line, which is SISO, or MIMO, which is bonding, and give up to 1.5 gig service to these subscribers. So here's some of the solutions available today. So this is a lot of the stuff that uh, you, you may have seen KT Global advertising today. So we have things from 24 port GAMs to 8 port GAMs to fiber extenders. And again, the flexibility of coax or twisted pair. And unlike GFAST, in these coax scenarios, we can actually run point to multi-point, uh, similar to the Mocha guys, but with only up to 16 versus 32. So here's a bit more about how the crosstalk mitigation works. So basically we have an agent that runs an HDPU that's constantly sending back traffic statistics. It also can do uh, crosstalk measurements, background noise measurements, H-log, all, all the traditional DSL stuff. So this is actually done and in, in sent into the cloud itself. And we can support these crosstalk measurements even between different DPUs with no communication. So you don't need to have a high-speed uh, high bus built between these. This can all work just through the cloud and it works quite nicely. So with this, these DPUs are sending traffic reports once per second, and then we send optimized PSDs down to each of these uh, units in real time to do the, the crosstalk mitigation. So again, as I mentioned, this is really one of the more innovative uses of network function virtualization. So this is a little bit more about it. So in a steady state, users are just watching Netflix, uh, surfing the net. They don't need a lot of bandwidth, so they don't need the whole 200 megahertz uh, frequency spectrum. So we'll only allocate them, say, the lower 30 megahertz. But then they run a speed test, they go to download the latest game off Steam, whatever. Then we'll actually scale it up, allocate them up to 200 megahertz on the line. And then if they don't need quite that much bandwidth, we'll carve it down maybe only 100 megahertz or 150 megahertz. And what we see, although this isn't vectoring, because uh, statistically bandwidth is very, very bursty, that this works extremely well. And we get about 80 to 90% of uh, GFAST 212 performance, at uh, basically a fraction of the complexity, power consumption, and cost. Okay, so a little bit about the uh, G2HN standards. So if anyone here is familiar with it, you had your first generation G2HN, which some of you probably saw in power line adapters. So that can do about a gigabit full duplex. So that was initially what uh, the guys in Korea deployed on their, their network build. Then a couple years back, we have uh, the G2HN Wave 2, which does two gig aggregate, and that's what TELUS is deploying today, or uh, about to deploy. 
But just like the GFAST guys, we're continuing to evolve things. So we have what we call, well, we're calling it G.H in wave three, and then the ITUT spec is still kind of unnamed, but we have similar performance targets, which is 10 gig full duplex, uh, optimized forward air correction, um, optimized retransmission, lots of little uh, neat tricks. So this actually says July 2019 for consent on that. That's not correct. It's actually uh, January 2020. But with that, you'll get the whole 10 gig uh, symmetric band plan for running on coax, probably around five gig for phone line. We'll possibly look at expanding that uh, to higher levels of MIMO from two by two MIMO to three by three MIMO on phone line as well. And with that, we have 14 bits per tone. Yeah, optimized retransmission and the FEC. So if you're familiar with GDHN today, we're using a near Shen and LDPC coding. So we're actually gonna improve that for the 10 gig version. We'll be moving to multi-level LDPC, where essentially the first six bits can be uh, FEC coded. The next six to eight won't be, they'll be sent uncoded. So the interesting implications of that is we save power, we reduce transistor real estate, and we actually improve performance. We're not wasting uh, bits for forward air correction when we don't need to. So that'll be one of the cool innovations that we'll be doing. And I think the GFAST guys are copying us on that one as well. So a little bit about uh, some operator deployments. Okay, so tell us. So this is our guy, the, the MicroDPU. So we've been developing this with Method Electronics for the past couple of years here. So this has a two by 2.5 gig SFP cages, a nice Marvell sock, integrated reverse powering. And one of the cool things with this box is it's supported mainline Linux. There's a lot of talk today about security and about things, uh, gateway software stacks. With this, there's no SDK. So we're not reliant on Qualcomm or Broadcom's latest uh, gateway SDK. We are in mainline Linux. I'm not just talking about the SOC. The actual device tree for the MicroDP was added in Linux 5.1. Likewise, with mainline OpenWRT, we are directly in mainline OpenWRT. So some other people talked about, oh, we have OpenWRT in a gateway. They don't have OpenWRT. You have OpenWRT forked off from some point in time. You're adding patches to it, but ultimately you're out of date. You're gonna be behind on security features. You're gonna have more exploits in your code and you're gonna be behind on this feature set in general. With us, we're in mainline OpenWRT today. You can go to openwrt.org, download the tarball, make menu config, and actually build a firmware for the MicroDPU. So it's really the, the first uh, DPU device I've seen anywhere that has that. One of the other cool things if you're a software person uh, is data plane acceleration. So you have things like DPDK, XDP, uh, and NetMap. We'll actually be supporting that in Linux 5.4 on the MicroDPU. So this basically gives us hardware forwarding like performance, but with full software flexibility. And again, no proprietary SDK. So we're not reliant on any one vendor, right? We're reliant on Linus Torvalds releasing this code. So we're an SFP-based uh, SFP device. So right now we're uh, primarily targeting the G.H and SISO SFP, but we also have a Mocha 2.5 SFP coming out and actually a 2.5 gig base T SFP for scenarios where we have access to Cat5e. It's kind of uh, that picture there. That's our primary deployment model. We're really targeting this guy for MDU scenarios, smaller MDUs, where for whatever reason we can pass it with our fiber footprint. So sometimes we're just not able to, the building owner won't like it, they don't want us to drill, a variety of different reasons. So with this, we have the GDHN SFP module in the MicroDPU, a GPON SFP module in there as well, and then a corresponding GDHN SFP module in the, the customer premise. So the same SFP module is used on each side. And again, it's all with reverse powering. So this is showing a bit about our field trials. So we've done a couple field trials and we're currently in an employee market trial. So the one on the left there, you can see that's one of our first trial buildings. I did the wiring, so not too clean. The one on the right was done by a proper outside plant team and it's a tiny bit cleaner. So we actually worked with a local company in Edmonton to build uh, an enclosure to house these devices. So this was actually very low cost, 40 Canadian, which is I think like $3 American or something like that. And actually all on this, all of our customers are getting 1.3 gig. And with uh, speedtest.net, they're all showing about 900 meg uh, symmetric. So with that, we actually left little speed test appliances in their home with Ookla's actual clients running on that. And then we're running these results over time and we see that we, we get the actual throughput that we expect. So one of the next innovations that we're working on is G.H.N. MIMO. So if you're familiar with uh, how that uh, G.H.N. is implemented with Max Linear's chip, it actually has bonding at the transceiver level. So if you want to do bonding or MIMO, you just add an extra AFE. You don't have to worry about burning two ports on a DPU to do bonding. A 24-port DPU can do single line on everything, bonding on everything with G.H.N. There's no reduction in port density. So with this, uh, this new SFP, mo uh, SFP module, we can support um, two by 100 megahertz Hertz GDH and MIMO in two pairs, and that's with full two-sided um, MIMO beamforming. 
So it's, it's a, a proper closed loop beamforming implementation. And with that, they're getting about a gigabit aggregate on a thousand feet on CAD 55 cable over two pairs, which is pretty darn impressive. The downside is it's about three watts power consumption in MIMO mode, which means it can be problematic in a lot of devices on, uh, on your network today. Most things that even claim the MSA spec of two watts can't really do it. So we've noticed that uh, we've had to work with, for example, our gateway vendor. We've had to say this needs to be engineered for three watt SFPs. And it's not a, a large amount of uh, work, but it is still some additional requirements. So we're also working on some, uh, some larger DPUs. So we have about 10% of the, uh, the MDUs in Western Canada are over 100 suites. So in that scenario, we can't cover all of them with fiber, roughly 30% we've had to skip so far. So we really need a higher density solution to deal with these uh, sorts of scenarios. And while we were looking at 48 port GFAST, that uh, sadly did not really ever pan out. So we're now looking at um, G.HN multi-port DPUs. So this is showing one from Positron Access, and the Positron guy is over there somewhere. But this is 12 or 24 ports. Uh, you can do CISO or MIMO on each port. Again, there's no reduction in port density for bonding. Each port can do single line or bonded. And there's also a coax variant as well. And if you're familiar with any of the stuff that KT Global has, uh, has released, uh, the, the GAMs, for example, used in South Korea, they're nice, but in my opinion, they don't really meet North American standards for what, we, what we'd expect. Some of them lack some North American safety standards. It's just generally not something that we're used to if you're used to something like uh, Nokia Calyx or Huawei gear. And with this, we can run the crosstalk mitigation actually on the GAM itself or in the cloud. So we have this in our lab testing right now. Okay, so a little bit about the MicroDPU API. So when we wanted to run a single port fiber extender, like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna be cool over a NetConf, Yang, all that stuff. Then we realized you probably can't have 100,000 plus devices calling home to a NetConf PMA. So we realized right away that there is uh, hard scaling issues that we could not resolve with NetConf to date. And I'm sure if we spent enough time through enough servers, VMs, and manpower at it, we could get NetConf working. But ultimately, yeah, we went with a, well, probably not a simpler solution, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. We built our own API to manage the, uh, the micro DPUs. And with this, it's a hyperscale NoSQL uh, backend with a simple REST JSON northbound and southbound interface. This allows us to provide orchestrations so that we can steer micro DPUs or uh, a GAM, for example, to a vector boost instance in the cloud. So it's really, we wrapped Max Linear's code with a nice orchestration layer to handle that. And with that, we can actually support arbitrary DPU topologies. So you can go into an MDU, a large MDU, have some stack of 24 port DPUs, maybe with a couple single port fiber extenders as well for business customers who want to do CWD and backhaul. We can really support any combination of topologies up to a thousand ports in theory. The other cool thing that we're working on with this is uh, actually having a GAMs or DPUs that can be owned by different ISPs, or managed by different ISPs, but actually running the same vector boost instance. So we th see this as a problem right now in Western Canada. We have one, uh, one ISP that's deploying GFAST in the lower mainland in some of our MDUs. Well, if we go to that same MDU with GFAST, G to HN, there's potential for us cross-talking onto each other. Some of their customers will see the rates impacted. Some of ours will see the rates impacted. So we really want to avoid that. So if I have a wholesale ISP, I want them to be able to call home to our vector boost instance so that we're not going to kill each other with crosstalk. And with this technology, we're making this happen. So there's also, uh, with GFAST, this has been a, a issue at the regulatory level with some CLEX and wholesale ISPs that like to run their own DPUs. With GFAST, there's no real cross-node vectoring, much less a, a standards of vendor agnostic way to do it. So with this solution, we can provide that and really support a true multi-ISP, multi-DPU, multi-vendor environment. And yeah, this code, like everything for the micro DPUs on our GitHub, well, it will be in 2020 and will all be given away for whoever wants to do cool things with it. Can't talk about this without reverse powering. So reverse powering is really a core, uh, core functionality of how we did the micro DPU. So for this, we've been working with uh, Leah Networks. They're really the guys for reverse powering. So if you're doing anything re with reverse powering, you want to be talking to Leah. Their RPF inject works extremely well. You plug it in, it comes up. So when we did our first micro DPU uh, garage install, the field tech's like, I don't know how we're gonna do this. The power, there's no power nearby. The power supply is not in the box. We gotta cancel the install. Like, no, no, we're reverse powering. The power is provided over the customer drop. You can see the field tech mind is just blown. So RPF changes things. It makes installs uh, a lot simpler and it solves problems in ways that you didn't think was possible. But there is a caveat. So we noticed that RPF can be problematic in the lab. So like everyone, we have our, our DSLAMs, GFAST DPUs, everything connected to a nice uh, telebyte automated cable farm. So we go through our different loop segments, we do the switching, this and that. 
We noticed when we switched one time from a 100 meter to a zero meter, one or two of our DPUs died. What's going on? We checked the connections, the physical is all good. The RPF circuit was shot. It was completely burned out. So we sent that unit to a Method Electronics. They worked with Telebyte and Microsemi, and they indicated, oh, this is kind of a, a weird edge case. It turns out when you do that, you get inductive back EMF, causing a voltage current spike that blew away the RPF circuit. And unfortunately, in the Etsy uh, TS101-548 RPF standard, there's no real clear guidance on that or as how to manage that problem. So Method had to work with Microsemi, and they basically had to modify the surge protection to deal with that. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, CenturyLink's G.HN uh, work. So they're not deploying, they're playing within the lab. So this information I got from Tom Barnett at CenturyLink. So it's not necessarily representative of everything CenturyLink's doing, but it's uh, something that some teams are working on. So they've been running uh, numerous field trials with a ReadyLink uh, GAM in various port densities and a couple different uh, MDUs. So one of the interesting results of this is they're claiming that it's about 40% cheaper than GFAST, uh, GFAST DPU from an equivalent vendor at the same rate. Actually, the G2HN one should still be faster. And they also been playing with using G2HN as copper backhaul. So actually having lag groups with multiple G2HN as a, a backhaul to a nearest fiber fed cabinet. In addition to that, they're actually playing with the cool fiber, the pedestal program as well. So our, our micro DPU, it's a single port fiber extender that's SFP based. They're actually building a four port uh, kind of DPU that's also SFP based. So with that, they're actually going to run G.HN on the access layer. Then they're going to have a G.HN to G.HN bridge that'll actually carry it into the home. And then distribution in the home, uh, to potentially for Wi-Fi extenders with power line or even phone line uh, backhaul to the, the NID. So it's some interesting stuff and really a different way of looking things if you come from a GFAST or DSL world. So here's a bit more detail on their, uh, the uh, DPU that they're looking at. So again, it's SFP based, similar to our uh, DPU, and it uses the same SFPs from Method Electronics. And yeah, reverse powering, XGS pun uplink via SFP plus ONT, and yeah, non-blocking. And that's really uh, what we have on GRHN. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Paul.